right uh, good uh, evening everyone uh, my name is is greg smith it's lovely to be uh, to be invited along to uh, uh, to join this uh, webinar this evening i live as uh, georgie was saying i live on the isle of cole where i run a small wildlife guiding business called wild smiths and for the last three years we've been working with nature trek to lead a uh, a series of week-long tours for them on the island um there's their small group tours usually seven or eight and uh, we spread the tours out through the year uh, across the months of May, June and July, uh, kind of reflecting the different wildlife wonders that you're likely to encounter uh, at different times of the Hebridean summer. So uh, um, I also lead other tours for, let me just, that's moving along. Yeah, we go. I also lead uh, yeah, other tours in Scotland for Nature Trek, including the absolutely wonderful Islands on the Edge of the Atlantic tour. Uh, which is a uh, uh, a nine day wildlife cruise around the inner and outer Hebrides and uh, heading out to the St Kilda archipelago. Um, so that gives me an excuse to include a photograph from a photograph from uh, Herta there in the bottom right, with a lovely fulmer sitting on top of a on top of a wall. Um, so really, this uh, this whole talk is just an excuse to uh, um, to show some lovely photographs of, of the island of Col, in which the sun is always shining, the sea is always azure, and the wildlife always performs for the camera, all in an attempt to lure you up. And uh, although the focus of my talk is very much on Col, I hope that this might also act as an enticement to other uh, Hebridean uh, adventures which Nature Trek has to, uh, has to offer. But uh, before I go any further, let me just uh, explain to you the, the structure of the talk. I think the, the talk will be in three parts. First of all, a bit about Col itself. Second, an outline of the structure of a typical tour with Nature Trek. And then finally, I'll kind of wander around some of the uh, the, the main habitats on the island and show you some of the some of the special wildlife from there. So uh, let me just so that's the structure. Three parts and uh, and then four bits of uh, of habitat uh, uh, to to end up with. So. Um, let's start with a bit about the Isle of Col itself. So first of all, you're going to ask me, so where exactly is Col? Well, I'm hoping that this map will help. There's a, a map of Scotland and the red square is the, the, the area you want to focus on. Um, uh, tonight, uh, Matt has been talking from Shetland out, uh, out uh, north of uh, Orkney. You can just see a bit of Shetland there in a little box that's been snuck down to get it a bit closer to the rest of Britain. Um, later, Steve will be reporting from Arden American, but for the next 20 minutes, I will be talking about the, the West Coast Islands. And so Cull, if I move my cursor, I hope you can see that. Cull is here. Um, this, this island here is Cull. Um, uh, it sits with its sister Tyree, uh, just a few miles to the west of the Isle of Mull. Um, so uh, just to orientate you on this slightly more uh, uh, detailed map, we've got Oban down over here. Um, the um, Morven and Ardnamurchan up on the mainland up there and Mull over here. And then out in the middle of the Sea of the Hebrides is the island of, uh, of Col. Um, so let's, uh, let's move on. So uh, this, is, uh, this is Col. This is the, uh, the back cover of my uh, OS Explorer 372 map. Um, I, one of the things that I think is really special about Col is that it's small enough to occupy uh, one side of a 1 to 25,000 OS map sheet, uh, which I, I like. It means there's no fiddly walk. So where you're on the edge of the two maps or you're on the fold of the map and you're constantly having to go from one map to the other. So uh, um, that, that's one of the reasons I like Col. It's only 13 miles long, about three miles wide. And you can see it's along with Tyree, it's on this, this striking kind of northeast, southwest uh, orientation. Um, the island has one principal uh, uh, village which is here the village of Aranagor which is our base for the uh, uh, for the week and um, which is where the, the ferries come into so um, the island has a population of about 170 people uh, there are several farm businesses on the island mostly uh, involved in extensive conservation grazing enterprises with uh, several hundred sheep and uh, and cows it's a working island. We're always very respectful of that fact in where we go and uh, and kind of how we behave. Now, uh, for those of you of a cert with children of a certain age, you may be familiar with Katie Morag. Well, Cull is the island of Katie Morag, and uh, uh, the Mary Hedwick, the uh, author of those books, um, she did a great job, I think, in capturing the essence of the place 
So if you're familiar with those books, you'll have a good idea of what the, the lie of the land is on uh, on, on coal. Uh, the island has 600 species of, uh, of wildflowers. Um, and like most Hebridean islands, it doesn't have many trees. Um, it has 110 regularly occurring species of bird, uh, like these hen harrier and white-tailed eagle. Um, but it's also got uh, uh, some rarities from the biggest fish in UK waters, bottom left, that's the basking shark, uh, to the tiniest, tiniest plant mite. This is a, uh, a little arachnid that lives on the, the galls on the bloody crane's bill, which is only, and you can see these striking, uh, bizarre, twisted growths on the, on the crane's bill. Uh, the crane's bill is quite a common plant in the maca on coal, but uh, this, uh, this species of mite is only known from a handful of places in, uh, in Britain. So just carrying on with uh, an introduction to coal, the first thing that, that I always think uh, to understand a place, I always think it's important to understand a bit about its geology and a bit about the, the history of human land use there. And these two facts explain why coal looks like it does. So we spend a bit of time on the tour looking at the rocks in their different guises. And we talk about the history of human occupation, farming practices over the ages, this sort of thing, which explain the, why the place looks like it does. So Cull is underlain by this ancient Louisian gneiss. Um, that's that wonderful, uh, twisty, convoluted, banded rock, bottom left. Um, and the gneiss uh, is always playing peekaboo at the surface. You always get in a nice landscape. Sorry, nice. that's a G-N-E-I-S-S. But it's also nice as well. Um, but it gives rise to this kind of lovely, interesting kind of a uh, um, rocky, speckled, speckled kind of a uh, kind of landscape. Um, the, it's a metamorphic rock, and it's some of the oldest rock on the planet, sculpted in the last two million years by glaciers, which give rise to this characteristic low, rolling, rocky landscape. Um, as we shall see, uh, since the last ice age, uh, the story of Col is very much a West Side story. Uh, it's all about the prevailing wind blowing kind of shelly sands up off the beaches into the lower lying areas, creating sand dunes all along the western flank of the island. And these in themselves then support about 700 hectares of stunning, absolutely mind blowing, uh, unimproved macaire grasslands on the on the sand dunes. The highest point on Col is only 106 metres. And from there on a clear day, this will help you with the orientation. Uh, when you look to the north, you can see the Coolins on Sky. When you look to the east, you can see Ben Nevis. When you look south, you can see as far as the Paps on Jura, and then to the west, the Western Isles, and beyond them, Canada. Although I have to say that however hard I stare, I've not managed to see that yet from uh, uh, from the top of the uh, uh, Coles highest point. So let's move then on to uh, the second part of my talk, which is going to be around the, the structure of a typical tour. Um, and we'll, uh, we always start the tour in Oban. So we, I come over to Oban from the island and we all meet up at a hotel. Um, uh, we take a stroll along the seafront with a chance to see uh, the, the black guillemots or tysties, uh, which nest in, uh, in, well, they occur in almost every harbour up here. So they're a characteristic of any kind of a enclosed, uh, sheltered area along the west coast. Um, we take a stroll along to a local restaurant where uh, uh, where the conversation is often around who we are, why we've booked on this particular tour and what we hope to get out of the trip. And for me, that's a really important start to the week because it gives me a chance to kind of plan the week ahead and shape the week to try and reflect those uh, interests and ambitions. Uh, the next day, it's an early start, I'm afraid. Uh, seven o'clock ferry, or if Calmac are up to its tricks, it could even be a six o'clock ferry, which means a very early start. Um, the crossing takes about three hours and we spend pretty much all of that time, whatever the weather, up on deck. Uh, it's a good test of our warm clothing and our waterproofs. Uh, some people don't believe the joining instructions when they say for a, a trip in Britain in July, you'll need to bring woolly hats and gloves. Um, but they're definitely required as well as your, your sun hats and sun cream. Uh, the crossing usually starts with Harbour Porpoise in the Firth, for, Firth of Lawn, if we're lucky. And if we're not lucky, then you might get a, a lecture from me in the age classification of herring gulls, which at least would, there will definitely be around. Um, there's always plenty to see up the sound of uh, the sound of mull, eagles, terns, gannets and other seabirds. But the, the action really starts once you get out of the sound of mull into the Sea of the Hebrides 
Here you'll see, uh, you have a good chance, I should say, of seeing uh, cetaceans like this breaching bottlenose dolphin, uh, vast rafts of uh, Manx shearwaters, which breed in huge numbers down on, uh, um, down on, uh, uh, up, up on Rum, I should say, just to the north of, uh, of Col. So uh, we arrive in Aranagor and uh, we check in at Tainamara, our, an award-winning guest house, which is our home for the week. And there's a picture of our hostess, uh, Paula, who looks after everyone wonderfully. Um, then uh, I should say that that garden wall made me think that uh, very often in the garden here you'll see hunting hen harriers and there's often a pair of uh, uh, common sandpipers displaying to uh, to each other on that uh, on that bit of wall there very close to the bay beyond the bottom left hand photo here shows that bay and uh, in the background is the hotel where we go and have lunch on our first day I should say the award winning Cole Hotel. Um, and I always think, bottom right, this is the finest bird hide in uh, on the island, perhaps even anywhere in Britain. Uh, in the comfort of uh, of uh, uh, a nice, warm, dry space with some excellent food, you can look out and watch hen harriers and skewers and white-tailed eagles doing their stuff out over the uh, over the moorland to the north. Very, very uh, magical place. Um, we then followed this up with an orientation tour of the island in the minibus. Now, I should say there are only 15 miles of road on Col. And even at my slow speed of driving, um, it doesn't take long to get uh, uh, to get round. So this isn't a holiday where you're going to be spending a lot of time in a minibus, um, uh, traveling to distant sites, um, unless that is it's really wet and I take pity on you, in which case we do. We might do two or three tours of the island as orientation. Um, I should say that the photographs on this page are, aren't mine, unlike the others in this uh, presentation, but uh, they've been borrowed from various uh, businesses, the, the respective websites of the, these various businesses that we work with. Um, so the rest of the week, it, basically, we go walking. Um, we take daily walks in different habitats around the, the island with me rattling away enthusiastically in the background. Um, I usually try and involve some locals in the in the walks. That's a picture of my wife on the top right there, um, enjoying the weather. Uh, and we'll do we'll do a, a, a dawn chorus walk. We'll have my moth trap will be run over a couple of evenings. We'll uh, we'll maybe even have tea and cakes in the garden of my little cottage if you're if you're lucky. But it's a very kind of sociable, very and I hope kind of interesting and diverse week. Um, uh, now, Steve is going to talk a bit later on about a visit to the Treshnish Islands that we always do from the Arden American uh, trips. But uh, we also do this from uh, from Cole. The Treshnish Islands are just a short hop uh, on a rib down from uh, from Col. And uh, early in the week, we usually try and get down there to visit the uh, seabird colony. Now, I should say there's a whole evening's talk to be had on uh, on the birds of um, uh, of, of uh, the Treshnish Islands and in particular on Lunga. But suffice it to say, this is a unique, almost almost magical opportunity to get up close and personal with, with puffins and to experience a real uh, seabird cliff colony at close quarters uh, where we've got a, something like 15,000 uh, uh, common guillemots breeding. Uh, the boat trip out there in a small rib usually has dolphins bow riding. Uh, and this year, one lucky group had a lunge feeding minke whale not very close to the boat, but close enough for us to see what was going on. That was really exciting. Now, uh, Matt, what was your phrase? You described the Bonksy as the meanest of them all. Well, uh, the, this is uh, in 2021 uh, on our boat trip. We witnessed this extraordinary spectacle of a Bonksy catching, drowning, and then plucking a poor Manx Guillemot, the Manx Shearwater, uh, on the still glassy, clear water, calm water of the sea. Extraordinary, extraordinary experience, and these wonderful photographs, whole series of wonderful photographs taken of that uh, of that moment. But more from Steve on uh, uh, on the Treshnish Islands later. So now we're going to move to part three of the talk, where I'm going to talk about uh, four different habitats that we spend our time in uh, uh, on the island, and which reflect the range of wildlife wonders that the uh, island has to offer. Um, now there's a small area of marginally better agricultural land on the glacial till soils in a glacial valley that runs kind of north-south across the island down at the west end. And it's here that there are hay meadows and silage fields. And it's also here that uh, the RSPB established its presence, first of all, in the late 1980s. Uh, always struck me as odd that they should ch choose a piece of farmland rather than these wonderful moorlands and uh, macro habitats. But clearly the reason they did is because it's in this farmland 
that the corn crakes hang out. And uh, this bench here is a place that you get used to. We'll spend quite a bit of time sat on this bench scanning the surrounding fields for corn crakes. Uh, the, the corn crake is a really spe special feature of coal. Along with Ty his neighbor in Tyree, we have something like 30% of the Brit British and Irish breeding population of corn crake. So a massively declined bird that's doing well, I should say, um, uh, on uh, uh, in these areas. It's been declining in recent years, but this last this year we've just had was the best breeding season we've had in some time. So uh, um, uh, the uh, corn crakes arrive here from Africa in about the third week of April. And after a flight of 5,000 miles, they flop down into the underground and say, bugger if I'm going up there again. So uh, you, um, uh, you, you hear them and their distinctive repetitive call all around, but uh, seeing them can be quite tricky even early in the season, like this top right, where the corn crake is taller than the vegetation. But when the vegetation gets taller than the corn crake, then you have to hope that one hops out into up onto a rock like the one bottom left to uh, to give you a view. But it's like with most things in nature, if you spend long enough and you, you're persistent enough, then they do uh, they do perform for you. And we usually uh, there have been very few groups who haven't in, over the course of uh, the last few years managed to see uh, uh, corn crakes on this nature trek tour. Uh, so you'll, as I say, you'll get used to this bench, um, but we do occasionally take a break and uh, head out for a sandwich on a nearby beach if we need a change of scene. But there's also interesting things to be seen from here. The uh, uh, just to continue uh, Matt's theme of waders on fence posts. Here's uh, an obliging snipe, snipe red shank lapwing breed down in the wetlands, and they give a fantastic soundscape to our uh, to our time in this part of the island. But there are also good numbers of twight and cuckoo, bottom right, also sitting on a fence post. Um, and a number of brown hares as well, which were introduced uh, uh, 100 years or so ago to the uh, uh, to the island. And these do uh, these seem to do quite well and they give quite they're quite confiding. So they're good photographic opportunities from them. Uh, so I'm now going to move on to uh, the second habitat. That's the, the Maca. Uh, just have a quick check of my uh, my timing. I need to uh, move on quickly. So I run out of superlatives when trying to describe the experience of walking on Coles Macca. Um, suffice it to say, it's packed with huge variety of both common and less common wildflowers, supplemented by the occasional proper rarity. And all that botany in turn supports an amazing diversity of invertebrates. Um, uh, this image uh, illustrates a small number of the wildflowers that we get to enjoy. The, the bloody cranes bill is a common feature. We saw the uh, the Assyria gall that uh, that uh, the mite that um, uh, infests it. But uh, that candelabra structure, that wonderful seed head structure, is a wonderful wonderful uh, feature. In the June slacks, bottom left, we get to see the amazing range of forms of the early marsh orchids by their thousands. Uh, this is the gorgeous coccinia form. Uh, some of the rarities include the Irish ladies' tresses you've got there in the in the middle, um, which is a, a late summer orchid and one of Britain's rarest. And there are several sites for this on Cull. Um, the bottom right one is an interesting one. It's a quite a quite esoteric. It's quite an obscure dandelion called the many-lobed dandelion. Now, I'm the type of botanist who calls a dandelion a dandelion. I don't go into naming all the microspecies, but this one kind of spoke to me uh, when we uh, when we spotted it on a nature trek tour a couple of years ago. Um, and I posted a photograph of it on Twitter and uh, we set a little corner of Twitter alight, the uh, uh, the dandelion loving corner of Twitter. Turns out that this uh, pretty little plant is now extinct in England and only occurs in half a dozen locations on sand dunes around the Scottish coast. And this was the first modern record from the Isle of Cull. So that was very exciting. Um, a range of uh, range of invertebrates that I've uh, that I mentioned Um uh, several rare and distinctive bee species. The great yellow bumblebee occupies the Hebridean macca. And uh, this is the Hebridean form of the Moscada bee, which we regularly see. Uh, we keep an eye out for butterflies. This is the uh, the common, uh, fairly kind of frequently uh, uh, found dark green fritillary. But we also have macca specialists like that, that wonderful belted beauty, which is a fantastic micro moth. Uh, not a micro moth, but it's a, it's a fantastic little moth. Um, Lots of archaeology too, bottom right. This is a, and on Col, it's often more than just the lumps and bumps, a bit like Matt's amazing photographs of rocks and so on. Um, this is a Bronze Age kist burial that was uh, uncovered in the dunes in the 1970s, and you can clearly see the outline of the stones there. Um, now, the beetle top right is one of Col's very special bits of wildlife, the short necked oil beetle. 
extinct in the UK since the 1940s. It was uh, discovered on coal by the RSPB warden in 2008. Um, now, I've no time to explain the amazing lifestyle of this fat, flightless little beauty, um, but uh, it does demonstrate a whole, a whole kind of new corner of evolutionary innovation. Uh, and since its discovery on coal, it has colonized several neighboring islands. And I'll leave you to try and work out how a flightless beetle might do that. Uh, the coast comes next. So just quickly around the coast, uh, there's always fantastic things to see on the 25 glorious beaches which Cole has, uh, classic Hebridean beaches, um, but there's no time to sit around soaking up the rays. Uh, we usually clock up a dozen or more species of kelp and rack washed up on the uh, on the beaches. And here we're conducting our very own alien autopsy on a huge specimen of furbelows. And our beach combing is often watched by uh, curious seals, in this case, a couple of gray seals peering at us. Now, uh, otters, we regularly see signs of otters, sprites, runs and, uh, and footprints, and we frequently get to sniff their poo as well, um, but we only occasionally run into them in person. Uh, it's a good population on coal, but the best chance of seeing them is early in the morning. And this photograph bottom right was taken on a nature trek trip by the most wonderful photographer, Andy Naylor. Uh, I recommend you look up his website. Um, he was out at 5 a.m. every morning and every day he managed the most amazing photographs of otters. You can imagine by the end of the week, everyone else was setting their alarm clocks early to be able to join him. Um, uh, we occasionally see basking sharks from the beaches. Um, uh, uh, this is a kind of the dis distinctive shape of them, kind of with uh, uh, their dorsal fin and, uh, and tail fin showing. Um, as they kind of swim around hoovering up plankton. Uh, usually these are best seen later in the summer, but this one, this individual we saw um, uh, with the May group uh, from uh, uh, with Nature Trek uh, in May this year. Um, we do find amazing other things on, on the beaches like uh, jellyfish, mermaids' purses. Um, this is the, the, the mermaid's purse of a, or the, the eggs case of a flapper skate. Um, which is the biggest skate and the biggest uh, uh, egg case. Uh, it looks like a size 13 to me, as you can see, modeled next to my big boots. Um, we often come across these wonderful uh, by the wind sailors, um, fantastic colonial hydroids with a chitinous sail that you could, dis you could uh, disregard just as a little bit of plastic, but absolutely wonderful things. And even one lady last year found this sea bean. It's the seed from a liana which has been washed by the Gulf Stream all the way from a tropical rainforest in Central America all the way across the Atlantic to wash up on our beach here. You can see a little goose barnacle as a hitch to ride with it. So last of all, a quick jog around the moorland. I'll be very, very brief. Fantastic range of, uh, uh, it's the dominant, dominant habitat on coral, I should say, it occupies about 70% of the island, typically made up of wet and dry heath communities, sphagnum dominated peat bogs, and then uh, about 60 lochs and lochans with open water plant community communities. Um, wetland plants are wonderful, like the stunning water lobelia on the left. Uh, the ridiculously rare pipewort in the middle there with its nonchalant array of flowering spikes. Uh, several types of uh, insectivorous plants, including this sundew on the right. Um, the moorland area is designated as SPA. Uh, is, we've got two species of breeding skewers. Uh, in the middle there, you can see the bonksy, the great skewer, and to the right, the elegant uh, um, arctic skewer, and to the left, the red-throated diver, whose barking calls provide a kind of soundtrack to the summer on coal. Um, uh, there's a fabulous place where we, uh, uh, a roadside loch, where we often stop to watch both species of skewer having a wash up. And there was an occasion last year when a pair of red-throated divers came in and sat on the loch next to them. And then a gleaming male hen harrier flew across the uh, the moorland behind. An absolutely magical, magical moment. Moorland has a, a fantastic range of other interests. Some fabulous invertebrates like this uh, green tiger beetle, which they've newly arrived on coal. We've only started seeing them in the last couple of years. Wonderful range of orchids. My favourite, the one on the right there, is the heath fragrant orchid. Uh, which we uh, we uh, ritualistically we kneel down and cup our hands around it and sniff the uh, the sublime and uh, sacred aroma of the uh, uh, of the orchid. There are several celebrities on coal from the world of books, sports, and uh, film whom we occasionally bump into. But uh, but this old last twisty is always a favourite um, uh, with our with our guests. So I'll leave you with a, um, uh, a another classic flower from the Macca. The moss saxifrage. So, like our tours, I've rather run out of time. But uh, 
So there are tours in May, June and July to Cole, each with a different set of priorities and different uh, interests to see. Um, uh, my guiding philosophy is very much one of going to nice places and experiencing the wildlife that comes along rather than chasing around trying to find things. So if you like to visit remote and beautiful places, find amazing wildlife in good company with great food, then um, this town, this is going to be the tour for you.